Right. Okay, uh, thank you. My name is Costa and I work on Libc++. And in this talk, I want to uh, do a little bit of a overview of some of the interesting points of the implementation of uh, ranges and in particular focus on things we do di differently or in an interesting way in uh, libc++ and uh, fair warning we were having some technical difficulties with the presentation so if uh, slides start flickering or something like that uh, uh, I'm sorry about it hopefully it all goes well uh, fingers crossed Okay, so uh, first of all, to give a very brief uh, recap, uh, ranges are a major, major library feature that's been added in uh, C++20. Uh, and uh, from a uh, user's point of view, I would say it uh, consists of two main things. Uh, now we can call uh, all the classic STL algorithms on whole ranges, not just pairs of iterators, like we can just uh, pass uh, whole vector and uh, it's gonna just work to, for example, STD ranges sort. And second, uh, ranges provide something completely new uh, in uh, the standard uh, C++ library. It provides a rich collection of views that can be used to uh, creates uh, on uh, the fly this lazily evaluated uh, data processing pipelines. And it sounds like a mouthful, but uh, it should become a way uh, easier to grasp uh, with an example. So, uh, first of all, to, uh, let's see how uh, code can change when we apply ranges uh, to it. So, let's say we have this uh, piece of code that's uh, where we have a bunch of uh, shorter strings and we want to merge them all together into one longer string. And for good measure, let's say that we also want to merge in reverse order so that the string becomes reversed. And here is... Uh, code that achieves that uh, written in a more old-fashioned manner. So first we just uh, iterate over the, our collection of strings and uh, we use our beginner end so that we iterate in reverse order and for every segment we call std copy, we insert uh, into the uh, we use back inserter so that we insert new elements into our output stream. And again, we rely on our begin our end for uh, the reversal. And I wouldn't exactly call this code ugly, but it's uh, kind of long and uh, definitely takes a little bit to realize what's going on there. And with the uh, ranges, we could uh, uh, rewrite it to look uh, something like this. And uh, it's uh, shorter, but I would say the main benefit is that it's much closer to being uh, self-documented. Uh, we pipe uh, our input stream through a join view and through a reverse view. And as long as you can get used to this uh, creative uh, use of the uh, pipe operator, I would say it uh, becomes pretty readable. And uh, recently, ranges have been a major focus for uh, libc++. So for the past few releases in the LLVM 15, we shipped the, everything that was in the original one ranges proposal, which is most, I would say like 90% of uh, C++ 20 ranges. Uh, it's a huge proposal, <laughs> literally hundreds of pages. Then in the next release, we finished, we wrapped up the C++ 20 uh, stuff, uh, all, like, implemented the additional like bug fix uh, papers and uh, minor additions. And and in the very recent LLVM 17 release, we started with the C++ 23 stuff. Uh, there's still more to do on that front before uh, C++ 23 ranges is finished. So this uh, talk is from our recent implementation experience. So going back to our example, I will, it uh, looks, uh, I would say, pretty nice and ergonomic, but there's quite a bit uh, happening under the surface to provide this ergonomic interface. So first of all, uh, let's take a look at std ranges copy. It's, uh, well, we know that std copy is a free function and std ranges copy also looks just like a call to a free function. But in reality, ranges copy is actually a global variable. And that might be quite surprising. So why would that be the case? 
So uh, there is an interesting technical challenge here. So uh, that's to some extent like not unique, but very specific to range algorithms. So range algorithms have the, by design the exact same names as the uh, classic STL algorithms, which makes sense uh, uh, because they have uh, pretty much it's pretty much same algorithms, similar semantics, etc. Uh, so it makes sense to uh, name them the same way. Uh, but that also creates this issue. Let's say that std ranges copy was a free function. And uh, let's say a user uh, uh, has this uh, using declaration, which is uh, completely normal. We uh, say use an std ranges copy, so then we don't have to qualify all the namespaces. And uh, let's say we have an uh, output array of ints. It's not the, uh, that doesn't really matter. And then let's say we are calling copy on an input array of ints, and uh, we expect that std ranges copy would be called, and that's actually exactly what would happen. But then if the user were to switch to using a deck instead of an array and do the similar unqualified call to a copy, it would be pretty surprising that somehow this would actually call std copy and not std ranges copy. And uh, why would that be the case? Does anybody know? Yeah, I think somebody said ADL. That's great, exactly. The reason is ADL, argument dependent lookup, which is uh, basically when the compiler is searching for uh, building a list of candidates for overload resolution, it will look not only in the current namespace, not only in st among stuff that's made available through user declarations, it will also look into namespaces associated with any of the parameters. So when we were using a built-in array, it's, uh, point the pointers aren't uh, associated with any namespaces, but now that we switch to using to DEC, uh, DEC has iterators, uh, iterator classes, those are in std namespace, now suddenly uh, the compiler will look in std namespace and there is std copy there, and uh, for reasons I want to go into, uh, it's actually a better match than std ranges copy. So that's if std ranges copy were a free function, uh, in this case it would lose this uh, competition for being the best overload uh, resolution candidate. So to work around that, there's a very interesting trick. There's another rule that says that if during, when building that list of candidates, the compiler uh, finds a function object, it won't go to the step which would perform ADL. And for that reason, instead of having a free function uh, std ranges copy, we have a functor, like a struct that you can call as if it were a function. And it's a bit simplified from the actual implementation, but it gets the idea across it, so it would look uh, something like this. And then as a final stroke, uh, we create a, a global variable, an instance of that functor type. And because it's inline and const expert, there's no runtime overhead. And uh, the reason there is a global variable is it provides an extra bit of uh, syntax sugar. Now we don't have to instantiate that uh, functor every time uh, so that the call can properly emulate as if it were a function call. And uh, the interesting part here is that the standard doesn't actually prescribe this particular technique. Uh, the standard just says that for uh, those uh, algorithms, uh, argument-dependent lookup sh should be inhibited somehow. Like that's, uh, I think, the common technique uh, for this. But in theory, uh, we could, for example, have uh, special attributes uh, that we could attach to a free function that would say like no ADL or something. And in fact, I think there were some proposals along those lines. I don't know if uh, any of them landed yet. Uh, I don't think so. Okay, so now uh, let's go back to our code example and uh, I'll take a look at uh, ranges copy from a different perspective. Like uh, we now know it's a global variable. How could it be implemented? Oh, it seems that uh, the implementation should be uh, super simple, like how hard uh, can it be to copy from one iterator to another iterator? Like, uh, it looks like something straight out of the KNR book. But the bitter reality is that our implementation of std copy is something like 250 lines spread across two files. There's also utilities. And the main reason for that is because of optimizations. Like for one, uh, we 
do work to identify when it would be safe to replace uh, this uh, kind of uh, simple loop with a call to mem move, which would require that the storage is contiguous, the uh, data type is trivial, etc., and that can achieve uh, like two times uh, speed up. There are some other optimizations that I will touch upon a bit later in the presentation, and. Uh, STD copy is a good example, but it's uh, far from unique. We have uh, quite a few algorithms that uh, like have a straightforward implementation on paper, but uh, the actual implementation is complicated. Then there are some algorithms that are just bona fide, uh, complicated, like STD sort. So for that reason, we really, uh, when we started with uh, implementing Rage algorithms, we really didn't want to re-implement everything from scratch, and uh, in particular, the optimizations. Uh, for that reason, we share the implementation of most of the algorithms between the classic version and the ranges version. And uh, to really, like, the basic idea is that both of them would call an internal implementation uh, function. And that underscore underscore is, by the way, how we mark uh, things as internal in the library. So. The idea might be simple, but uh, there are quite a few challenges to it. Uh, the first two are not that interesting, uh, so I won't go into too much detail. Uh, essentially, it's that uh, the signatures of the algorithms between classic and ranges versions are a little different. Uh, for one, a range algorithm don't take iterator iterator pairs, they take iterator sentinel pairs, and uh, sentinel is more generic and less powerful than an iterator. Uh, sentinel only supports uh, comparing. You can compare an iterator to a sentinel to ask, uh, did this iterator reach this sentinel. But you can't, uh, in the general case, so for example, increment a sentinel. And uh, sometimes range algorithms return more information, like uh, they would return, give you both the input and the output iterator, for example, in a situation where a classic algorithm would only give you back the output iterator. And uh, they also accept uh, projections, uh, things like that. And, uh, uh, all of that boils down to the fact that we would implement our internal version of uh, this uh, function in the most generic way so that it can be called both from the range uh, um, context and uh, from the uh, classic context. The interesting part here is uh, the customization points. And I would use the customization points uh, kind of loosely. There are some proper customization points in the standard, which are functions that a user can sort of overload, provide their own version. But uh, also, there are cases where, for example, an algorithm would call either std next or std advanced or std ranges next, std ranges advanced, depending on the uh, context. And uh, we want to make sure that whether our internal function is called from a range algorithm or from a classic algorithm, it does the right thing, and sometimes the differences between those uh, things can be pretty subtle. So we solved that. Um, yeah. So to give a, like a more concrete example, let's say we have uh, some internal algorithm that calls uh, currently just always call, would call std iter swap before the ranges implementation, and now we would want it to call std ranges iter swap if it's called from a ranges context. So if you're familiar with the policy-based design, this is essentially what we did. And to dive a little bit into code here, uh, we have this uh, struct called iterops, iterator operations, because all, pretty much all this stuff is related to iterators. And uh, we have uh, two empty classes that are used as tags, the classic algorithm policy and the range algorithm policy. And iterops has exactly two instantiations based on this uh, empty tag, and those Instantiations. Basically, the cl classic instantiation would uh, call the std version of uh, the customization point or a similar function, and the range version uh, would call the its range counterpart. 
and uh, then uh, all the internal algorithms uh, would take uh, that elk policy tag as an additional uh, template argument and instead of calling for example iter swap directly it would uh, call uh, it on iter ops which is instantiated with that uh, policy tag and it would do the right thing and uh, sometimes internal functions call different internal functions and this design allows us to propagate the policy tag all the way down the uh, call pipeline and uh, uh, there are maybe something like 15 of these uh, customization points. And uh, once again, it was, doesn't sound maybe that complicated, but actually uh, identifying all those uh, uh, configurable bits uh, took us quite a bit of time and investigation. And we, in the process, we broke a major project. And I think the issue was that they had some uh, iterators with undefined behavior, but previously that undefined behavior was benign. And with our change, it uh, started crashing. So yeah, uh, lots of fun times. At, uh, after we did that, I think uh, from that point it just worked. And uh, the benefits are considerable. There, there is something like 100 range algorithms and uh, we share most of the implementation with the classic ones except for the most trivial stuff like for each. And uh, the, I would say the main benefit is that there is a single tr source of truth for any uh, optimizations, including new optimizations, which is still happened. Like just recently, we had a patch that optimized STD uh, equal uh, and STD ranges equal. And as far as I know, we are the only one of the three uh, major implementations of the standard library to do this. So this approach is unique to libc++ sharing the implementation. And uh, previously, I mentioned uh, something about other optimizations in uh, STD copy. So uh, let's uh, take a look at that. Uh, so let's say we have this uh, simple code that uh, copies uh, between two strings. And to illustrate, uh, let's say this is how it might look in memory. And this is a simplified representation. Like it doesn't necessarily, uh, string isn't necessarily laid out exactly this way, but for a quick illustration, it should work. So let's say that input uh, string has uh, some auxiliary data and also a pointer to some contiguous storage in memory. And uh, the output string is same. And uh, STD copy implementation can recognize that uh, this uh, storage pointed to by iterators is uh, contiguous, the char type is trivial, so it can just move from uh, one place in memory to another. A more interesting thing happens here, and it's a simplified version of the ranges code example that we had originally with the join view. So let's say we're joining an array of short strings into a, char, a longer char array, so we pipe uh, our inputs uh, through std views join into the outputs and here we could observe the following uh, there is we cannot uh, do just one uh, call to mem move because the storage isn't contiguous it's spread across three different places in memory however we can observe that uh, well each of those segments is itself uh, contiguous. So STD ranges copy is uh, smart enough to recognize that it can do three calls to mem move uh, in this case. And the reason it can do that is because uh, join view uh, implement something uh, called, we call a segmented iterator. And a segmented iterator is an iterator that jumps uh, between different uh, contiguous segments in memory. It's an opt-in trait. And in certain cases, it can achieve up to uh, 20 uh, times uh, speed up, uh, which is pretty nice. And uh, uh, to uh, take a step back, uh, it's not just about the uh, code itself in the library. Sometimes it's also about interacting with uh, other uh, components. So we worked with the uh, LLDB team to make sure our uh, ranges look reasonable in the debugger. And uh, when we, uh, let's say we have this uh, simple code and uh, we want to examine the state of a view in uh, LLDB, uh, before, like, by default, it uh, looked like this, which I think you would agree is pretty uh, unreadable. And after some work by the LLDB team, it started looking like this, which I think is way nicer. Uh, so 
to summarize, I would say the general topic here is that there's a lot of complexity in the ranges library under the hood to provide this uh, nice uh, ergonomic interface. And uh, like in 20 minutes, we can only do a really quick overview. Like I really would have wished we could uh, dive into how those uh, pipe operators are implemented, but unfortunately that would be, I guess, its own talk. And uh, we saw how there are library tricks to uh, control uh, have some degree of control over overload resolution and uh, how we uh, do uh, things to manage that uh, complexity inside. And uh, we have lots of amazing open source uh, contributors who really, really helped uh, to push uh, ranges. And uh, if uh, all any of this uh, sounds exciting to you, if you are interested in joining, there's lots of work to do on the ranges front. So uh, you might consider contributing. We would be happy to get you up to speed. Okay, so this is all I had for the presentation. Thank you, and uh, I can take any questions. Questions? Hello, Konstantin. Thanks for bringing that goodness to libc++ and available to the entire community. That's pretty cool. Um, I got curious about the copy as a, a global variable thing that you were explaining earlier mm -hmm. in the talk. Is that also used for some, any other feature in libc++ or is this only used for ranges? Uh, off the top of my head, I think it's uh, unique to ranges. Uh, this technique is sometimes called uh, nibloids. Uh, I think it's also used in other implementations. I think, I think it basically came uh, with the original ranges proposal. Okay, thanks. And a uh, second question on the things that are specific to ranges like, uh, for example, implementation of reverse and other things like that. Is there any intent that in the future, you know, other features might need something that also don't use iterators and those things could be more generic or they're just mostly staying on the ranges side of things? Uh, for now, I think it's on the range side of things, uh, but it's an interesting question. Like, uh, we might uh, start using Sentinels more liberally in our internal implementation. Thank you. Any other questions? So, as a user of ranges, if, I, if I'm designing my, my own containers, do I have to do anything different from what we usually do to make these algorithms work uh, properly? Uh, generally, no. That's, I think, a big part of the design that uh, STL compatible uh, container is uh, all, like always a range. If you want to design your own view, then it becomes more interesting. But uh, containers, as long as they follow the STL conventions, should just work. Any other questions? So do you have um, regression tasks like for performance or code size and things like that? Is that uh, implemented in the C++? Uh, we have an extensive test suite, but uh, we focus on uh, correctness. We do have uh, some uh, tests for optimizations, like for example, that uh, stuff with the uh, STD copy, we do have quite a few uh, tests for that, and we do have some benchmarks. But we don't, uh, unfortunately, currently, we don't have a regression test for uh, benchmarks, and this is something we would really want to implement. Since you said uh, STD ranges is a global variable, do we need to worry about threat safety? Uh, no, I don't think so. It's stateless. All right, uh, let's thank the speaker. Uh, thank you, Constantine. Thank you. Thank you.